It's like a, a lovely grand entrance. <laughs> Welcome everybody. We're just going to give people another couple of minutes to join because we're expecting quite a few more. Um, thank you for taking time out of your evening and your busy days. And thank you especially to Lindsay for taking the time to join us and talk all about her practice, particularly her project at Yorkshire Sculpture Park and also her ongoing project at Jupiter Artland. How long is that on for, Lindsay, at Jupiter? Mm -hmm. Um, beginning of October. <laughs> I'm rubbish at dates. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you to everybody as well who had booked a ticket to join us on site at YSP and um has joined us online. And moving online has actually meant that we've been able to open it up geographically, which has been great. And um. We are welcoming questions, so if you drop any questions in the chat and then we'll pick those up. And um, some of the content, it's not always easy, the things we talk about, is it, Lindsay? So just to flag that for people. What does that mean? Like, I might swear a lot. I <laughs> might <laughs> as well. Um, <laughs> the content of your work. Um, yeah, it's just one big trigger warning, isn't it? can be very personal. Yeah. Uh, and but that also does mean and we found with our show that people really relate and respond to it very strongly. Which has creeped me out because I genuinely think there should be less uh, people like me being able to walk free. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a really insane thing to have people kind of contact you and say, oh, I really um, resonated with this. And you'd kind of be like, oh, my God. Poor you. <laughs> well, I mean, that's probably a good time to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we approached you to think of an idea for YSP for our Western Gallery. And when you first told me that um, you wanted to draw on an anxiety dream that you have recurring about there being a body buried that is about to be uncovered and... You're not totally sure why or how you've killed this person, but that you know you're responsible for it. And it's this feeling of absolute yeah. dread. Like literally the helicopters are flying over and the sirens are out the front door. Yeah. Meets the Brookside patio storyline meets Edgar Allan Poe. And obviously I couldn't help but be completely intrigued by this marriage of ideas but also couldn't completely picture I mean I think it's fair to say the sketch that you did although now I see oh, it <laughs> was exactly what you had in mind I um, feel I feel sorry for um I feel sorry for anyone who actually has to look at my first drawing so Eloise who Eloise Farley who I work on with um on the design of each show she kept she keeps all my first sketches where I'm trying to and she's just like it's a really hideous I don't want to see them all together because I'm the worst person at drawing it's not the natural way that I would do my work but yeah um I think but you know that one day there is going to be a catalogue resume with all those sketches in don't you no actually Obviously. there's not because I said that if anything ever happens and anything positive happens and that I die and someone says let's open up her sketchbooks guy's going to turn around to everyone and say no said this is not what she would have wanted she does not want anyone to know how bad she is at drawing and yeah so that's not happening ever <laughs> there's some things you there's some things you just don't need to see you know yeah there's not a lot that I... <laughs> so the idea for the show was there something particularly about Yorkshire Sculpture Park or the Western Gallery that um that brought these particular ideas together this is going to Yes. So I used to live in Sheffield and that was when I think Sheffield was the years where the iPhone came out and social media started, if you know what I mean. So that I was living there from about, I think it was, I can never get my dates right, but maybe about 2009 to 2015, just before I went to the Royal College. And um, there's a lot in Sheffield of me in my formative years. And that I think that that I'm actually terrified of how I might have acted or, you know, like, I feel like we're all going through a massive moment of just being absolutely fearful of 
past behaviors or you know and I think a lot of this show is about being utterly terrified that something I've done in my past which I can't think of a specific thing so which I think is why my psyche has sort of grabbed the Brookside storyline which if anyone hasn't actually I mean I'm hoping everyone has was lucky enough to see it but um in Brookside there was a man called Trevor Jordash and he um, mentally and physically abused his family and in the end it was his I think it's Mandy who stabs him and they hide him under the patio and then for two years they waited on this storyline and um, they just because everything wasn't so instantaneous in those days the storyline just kind of grew and grew and every now and again, if things weren't were sort of like lovely on the close, there'd be a like a burst, you know, like pipe or something or some, you know, something was going to happen and the body was going to be un- unearthed. And um, for me, this anxiety dream has just grown and grown. And the more that I've become someone like I, I never thought that artists would ever be in the public eye. Like I chose that I didn't want to be. I mean, I wouldn't have made it, but I just... <laughs> It's gonna sound so bad, but I, I didn't want to go on X Factor because I felt like I saw the nation tear people like yeah. Michelle Manners or Jesse Nelson apart, and I've always been bigger. So I thought an artist was kind of like a quieter, you know, like the yeah. work speaks for itself. And then now I've been, now I dyed my hair blue and then became more recognizable and put pictures of me and my boyfriend all over Instagram. Weirdly, you become recognizable. Nice you are. <laughs> And it is your name on the banner. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's a really weird thing because you never think that you'll actually become successful at something that you do. I, I find it very hard to say that I'm successful at what I'm doing because I'm a woman and obviously we're taught not to to always be. But yeah, but um, and I think that I wasn't ever ready. I don't feel like I, I think it's a thing of not feeling like you deserve any sort of success or just feeling like, it's such an out of body experience and that it's all going to come crashing down because, you know, like I have OCD and that means you obsess in the, like about the object and you obsess about being a terrible person. So this show is about this rumination of OCD and this rumination of this sort of terrifying nightmare that I have, but also trying to pull where did I, where did this terrifying nightmare come from? And so there's so many different references in the show. Like there's the hooch bottles that are everywhere. And then if you grew up in the nineties, you were constantly like bombarded as a child with all these things about like hooch will kill you. It's going to kill you. And then also like, do you remember, we were talking about it the other day, like the safety sort of um, adverts of like, you know, like being electrocuted or, you know, don't hold a firework, your arm will blow off. And so- yeah. All of these sorts of things have gone into the show, all of these like fearful infomercials. And like, you know, we were watching things of like the Blair Witch Project was there and that was told to us was true. And we yes. didn't have enough information to, you had to believe a story. Yeah. So I think that as- There was my, quite a lot of anxiety inducing content really in our lives growing up in the nineties. Yeah, there was, but it was also Technicolor and it was salacious and it was, it had humor in it as well and it was it was a very different time to was now but like that's the time that my sensibility was sort of forged like yeah. you know the first thing of knowing that you want things like as a child going to Toys R Us or blow up things and beaded curtains and I, that was the first time like I was saturated with a, like aesthetic desire yeah and I really wanted to capture and like marry this sort of time together like and it's a time that taste forgot <laughs> it's painting rooms it's just, and I think what's so great about this show that well I feel it really hard when I say what's so great about the show but like what's so great about this show <laughs> is um sorry I'm nervous I'll calm down and say is that it's pulling out these times in our culture that was never high culture doesn't belong doesn't technically belong in a gallery space and I feel like we've talked about it quite a bit but So often you go and see shows where the language and the typography is not anything that's to do with your life. It's if we look back at like, you know, in the future, we look back at these shows, they might not be very important, but I'm kind of asking who gets to say what's important, who gets to sift through our culture and sort of 
you know, popular culture and deem that as low importance, because to me, it's everything that made me into the person I am today. And I think I've just uh, checked the figure. So there'll be around 25,000 people will have seen the exhibition by the time it closes on Sunday. <laughs> Sorry to bring that on you when you just take <laughs> so ill <laughs> but we know from the feedback and from <laughs> the reactions and from the staff who are in the galleries communicating yeah. it but we know that um a lot of staff have come up to us and said that they really they really get it they really get the show they really they relate to it they want to bring their friends and family to see it um and that's the response from visit and it's interesting as well because you see whole age range of visitors going through and people different backgrounds and the little kids are, are kind of really drawn to the tactility the the objects the colors the the video um and then you can see people more my generation who are going oh I remember that advert I remember that I remember that storyline and um, oh, I remember that doing that with those um crisp packets and there's so much detail so the thing as you walk into the gallery you are um it feels like a room or a house that's being renovated so you get a sense of scaffolding and of the interior space of walls when you strip the plaster of walls and you get all of the the woodwork yeah um and then there are you've designed and um worked with Eloise who you work with a lot um rooms within that room mm -hmm. And so, and then you navigate it so you can walk through as if you're walking, so walking through somebody's house that's being all renovated and stripped apart. Um, and I loved how you described that one of the rooms is, oh, you know, when you decorate and you put all the junk in one room. So, you know, one <laughs> as you're working through. Yeah. I but think within each of those rooms is another narrative and there's another. Yeah. I think around the same time, I, where I used to live in, it's really weird because I haven't seen these two women for absolutely years, but we used to all live in a row, um, all of our houses, and I hope they won't mind it, but when one of our parents' families, our families were arguing, all the kids would go down to the other side or we'd all go and watch the football at one person's house, and I wanted to create that sense of community that was really important when I was growing up, so I wasn't brought up by one family. I think I was brought up by, like, three, and you, if you know what I mean, so... Yeah. I really wanted it to be this love letter to also the sense of adventure that we had because there was lots of times of my dad sort of um, lost his job and so he decided to build an um, an office at the back of the garden where we moved to and then he also wanted to add something onto the house so we were going through that moment of flux and I think as a child watching living on a building site is like so fun I mean it makes a sculptor out of anyone like it's like playing with some men you know what I mean like being grubby like you know being able to make up all these stories and I really wanted to I think I got before I did this show I had got very very tired and I think as an artist you you do get tired you get tired of at the moment I think there's a lot which is like raking the most personal um, memories that you have and I I find myself doing that a lot and I think this was this was equally like I wanted to create like an enjoyable place of horror that wasn't like a terrible thing that happened to me. It's a dream. So as it was a dream, it could almost be like a haunted house at a fun fair or something that you could have a sense of play. And because the time was rooted in my childhood, I I tried just to have so much fun when I was making, which is something that you're not meant to do like. A really incredible. I was talking to a really amazing artist, um, Heather Phillipson, who always inspires me. But she said, like, the time of making, even if it's something that you're, even if something that you're making is quite dark, is that space of party and play, and it's that moment that all of these incredible things are being made, and the content kind of goes out the window for a while because you're just enjoying the very facet of being able to make. Um, and I wanted to bring that to this show because I feel like as artists, we have to think about our work in a trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I really thought about this year about one side being play and being able to be disruptive and being able to make in the space, which I never do. And that's why Yorkshire was so important to me to do it, because it is a sculpture park. You encouraged me to like make in the space. You encouraged me to 
kind of think outside the box and we don't want to see the same thing from the same artists all the time and actually being given a, a space to like get it wrong or try a new material like for now it might not be the greatest thing ever or you know that trial but actually for me looking back on it I'm so glad I went in there and just attacked it and like yeah. as a woman you're fucking terrified about attacking a space you're always apologizing and you're always trying to make something that just is the right side of a line which you don't even know what the line is so it's like soon as you walk into the space that you are not confronted is the wrong word but you it's not apologetic it's no not, it's very it it holds the space and it creates other spaces within it and when you say that the may do you kind of think through that so once you've got the idea and then do you is your first intuition to go to clay and to, to make and to start creating the 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 reality that you've imagined I suppose yeah well first I ring guy <laughs> <laughs> so I, I my um studio like I work with studio assistants so they're like every time you do something I ring my partner like because obviously I'm an anxious person but I ring him and I have to describe and I describe the whole show in all detail and it's he'll say it's really ridiculous but it does all come flying at me at once because there'll be different strands I'll be thinking about like with where the bodies are buried. I was thinking so much about why I keep on having this dream. And then at the same time, I thought about Brookside and then the Edgar Allan Poe story and the, this idea of being found out. And we were doing stained glass and I was like, imagine this stained glass on the floor and the whole floor being taken up. And I was just like, fuck, we can do it. We could, we could do this. And that's what happens when you do move into being in something like Yorkshire Sculpture Park. like. For most of my life, I've heard no, or like, not in a horrible way, but just budgets, everything. Or like, I've always had to be careful and and you do have to make ideas. And I think it's a very good thing for younger artists to do because all of my shows used to be made of a budget of nothing. Yeah. And it's been some of my best shows, but there are things that you can do now, I can do now that feel so extraordinary and and we can build things from nothing. And being able to do that from the place where I have been has been the most emotional journey. Like, it's incredible. And I mean, like I actually walk in and I see the whole space, like for the first time, like a viewer does. It's amazing. And I think it's, it's. Um, I mean, you work with incredibly talented people. There's a lot of experienced people at YSP and they are all kind of, or they're all part of this shared vision and they bring something to it, but it is your vision. Um, and our team absolutely adored working on the show and being part of the build and build, you know, putting the structure together and then your team coming in and you. And and what what amazed me was I'd seen images of works. We talked about it. I'd seen the plans, but um, it was only when you were on site that I understood how meticulous, like literally to the where the Scrabble pieces were going, how meticulously planned it had been. Um, you know, there was there was it went very the install went very smoothly. It wasn't like, oh, I'm not sure where that's gonna go. I don't know. It was very much like, yep, yeah, this is oh, that, was, that was my least that was me playing. <laughs> <laughs> but when you said that's it all really cool. <laughs> You you kind of it felt like you'd pictured the whole thing all together all at once. Yeah, because I dream them. Like I I think that like I think of them all as experiences, and it was so funny because I've just read this book called Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow, and it's all about video games and everything is manufactured. Like you have to, in order for someone to suspend their disbelief and like believe in the idea, you have to saturate it. Like if there's a single thing out of place, they lose it. Yes. And they get angry at you because they've lost it as well, because that's how I used to feel. And I, we were talking earlier about my mum and like she used to do like the Santa's Grotto at school and everything would be done meticulously. Like she, everything she did, she did like to a T and you believed in it. And I think that's one of the things that I feel so lucky that people, I just heard that number again, that's horrendous. But I, I, feel, <laughs> I feel so lucky that people come and see the shows, but it's like people are lending, well, giving you their time and are coming to see it. And so I I don't think there's anything uncool about trying really hard. I try very, very hard. And I 
I want to please people. I want the work or I not even please people, but I want to piss them off or I want to, I want them to go out of it just feeling, feeling something, even if they hate it, even if, but like, I'm, I'm sorry to bring it up, but like the Jonathan Jones review of it, when he hated it, it's so nice because he meticulously described everything he hated so much. So he must have spent a bit of time with it. You know, like, you know, so it's like one of those sorts of things of like, it's it really makes me feel good that people are spending so much time with the work and also that they know that I have tried my hardest and I'm not just I'm not taking any opportunities for granted because yeah that would be a horrendous thing for me to feel that if I wasn't putting my all into something I think doing something by half is my worst fear but it is also an OCD thing it's yeah. just I sit up late at night and I just think of everything and I like to plan so nothing can go wrong because I'm working with a kiln that wants to kill me. <laughs> and everything can go wrong with that. So at least I planned the Scrabble board, even if it breaks. Like, but that makes sense. You, was ceramic your first material of choice? I mean, it sounds like you've always been an artist. It sounds like you've grown up in a space and a family where creativity is, is part of your upbringing. It's part of your life. Um, yeah, my mum is very, very creative. My mother, my dad had to draw the outlines of the little mermaids for us to colour in. I just be like, no, I'm not having dad do it. He's not quite so creative. But actually, the thing that I've got from him is having a bit of like business, which I think a lot of artists like you have to think you have to think a little bit business like with it all. Because also, otherwise... plan, you know, the planning and you really. Yeah studio you employ people well when you do employ people you have to be a lot smarter and you have to make sure that they will have employment for a foreseeable yeah. future and they're trusting you with their time so you have to be in that sort of way wait I forgot what the question was no oh, ceramic. <laughs> ceramic. Ceramic, your first, is it is it your primary material I mean it wasn't so I used to make I when I first went to school we did a lot of sculpture I did a lot of found object sculpture and collage yeah. and stuff um and then I realized that wasn't cool I, I just and I did a lot of leaning found objects against a wall and then this one time I tried air drying clay and I, there was this entity that I had imagined and it existed yeah but I just couldn't work out how the hell you'd start in ceramics and I was in Sheffield and I went to um, sort of like a smaller sort of pottery class, but you still could, I still couldn't get to where I wanted to be. So I made an air drying clay for ages. And I finally got to the Royal College of Art and they were just like, you're going to have to learn how to fire a pot. And because I'm a very fearful person. So if there's a something I don't understand, I'll make up a million reasons why I don't want to do it. So I don't have to like say that thing like I'm really scared. And my tutor turned around, she went, just fire a fucking pot. <laughs> and, and then I never looked back. <laughs> and it must, but it must be pretty terrifying because it is, um, it, I have spoken to other artists who work with ceramic and it is almost like a, a relationship or it, it's not, you're not entirely in control of it, are you, all the time? No, you never are. There is a, there's a. Yes, but then you, there's also things, you know, that are dicey. You, you get to learn the language of it. So, um, like, I know when I've pushed something too hard. If, In the if sense I, of the, the physicality of it and whether it's... Yeah, good. so, like, putting too much strain. Like, so when I do the larger pots that I make or the bin bags where you're trying to put so much on one vessel and in the and when it heats and contracts, it moves. So that's when you get cracks sort of formulating. Yes. Um, but I feel like... I. I can never talk about this because I feel like anything I say is going to jinx it. <laughs> so let's go for, I, this kiln is um, pissed off a lot of people in my time and, and it is the bane, you know, this, I can't make it any other way because it's so immediate and it's the best. I love the fact that I can walk into the studio and in the morning there's a bag of clay and then at, in the evening, there's something else there that I've made. And I feel like if you do have depression or OCD or feel like you're worthless quite often, to be able to take something and make it into something else in that period of time can be, is the, one of the most special things to you. Like it's something that made me stop seeing myself as such like a 
I don't know, a scary little gremlin who's sucking the life out of everyone. It made me realize that I had something else to give. And I think making and putting something in the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm worried about everything becoming landfill. Is that the right word? <laughs> like, or just like... That's a pretty long time. I think <laughs> 10,000 I... years, they could still find the bin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm worried that this is how they will think people thought then. But like, um, to be able to make something, to be able to... Because I think that also as an artist, you get very worried that you don't have a skill set or a particular, you know, like, I'm not a very good painter. You've seen my drawings. They're atrocious. And... There was this point that my dad was like, are you an artist? Because, you know, you know, and I could understand it because there was nothing that you could see that would last. Mm. And then these pots and then as I've been taking things out the kiln, it, they, I suddenly feel like I've got a bit more permanence in the world. So like when you asked me earlier, like, why do you go into this sort of like, why do you go into the studio? I just know that I need it. And because it's the only thing that keeps me tethered when everything else is so wild. Like, my life has got a lot more crazy. Like, I'm now at Tracy Emin's studios. And, like, we had a summer fair on... <laughs> it was so fun, though. We had a summer fair on Saturday. And it was just wild. All these sort of people there, like... There's just loads of really incredible things that are happening. And going into the studio and just being able to, like breathe and reboot it's the one thing that stays constant like even when my relationships are falling apart like I remember one guy time guy ran off sorry if you're listening to this guy um and if you're not um but all I had were my pots so I just kind of went back to the studio and just carried on and for the first I remember that day so strongly because for the first time I was like I really believe in what I'm doing and people can't take this away from me and it just felt really good yeah <laughs> is it quite um I know the firing there's a there's a process to the firing and the completion but the actual the first stage of it is that quite quick is that something that you can realize quite quickly it depends what I'm doing the pots no like yeah. any sort of pots that I make they've got to be coiled and you have to like it's really lovely because I'll just put on um a book and I'll just go for ages coiling and coiling and they just sort of grow and start looming above me and that's a really beautiful moment because it's totally like, I, I don't even realize I'm doing it, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. So it's like really second nature. And that bit's a really sort of gorgeous moment. But at the moment I'm making, no, it's loads of bits that you have to do at different drying times. So right now I'm making handbags. Yeah. Can anyone see these? Yeah. Amazing. So because they're sort of, they're kind of flat bags that they, the bags have to dry and then you have to really quickly try and go in with all the other stuff. So you have to make everything in stages. Actually, my studio is messy, so. <laughs> so the handbags, what was the, the idea behind the handbags? I told you this earlier, that's naughty. Um, <laughs> it's that thing of like, I, my best friend when I was in Sheffield, she used to call my handbag the bag of doom. <laughs> <laughs> you're never sure what you'll pull out of it so like it's just like they're the most atrocious oh I'm looking at mine now <laughs> I mean I came back from holiday a really long time ago and what we've got here is just random adapter <laughs> do, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean like it's it's just not good um but because handbags are so personal though. deeply personal I do not want any if anyone goes near my handbag to get like a ciggy out or something I'm just like oh, da, da, da. so these handbags are kind of like they've been abandoned in different places so I imagined if one was abandoned on Margate Beach and then one in the forest one in the back garden after a house party with all the bottles in and stuff so it's kind of but what's really nice about doing freeze is that you can kind of breathe a little bit like yeah you no know, it's like you can allow yourself just to take the time of making the work but like when I'm making a big installation it's like you've got one shot at them <laughs> oh yeah that was my pill alarm <laughs> we'll remind you at the end yeah thank you <laughs> and the show in 
Jupiter, which is on um, just outside Edinburgh, Sculpture Park outside Edinburgh with beautiful indoor spaces. Um, that's a, a, a completely different kind of I, aesthetic, I suppose, to the YSP show. But again, it is creating this environment um, and there's and now there's such a strong, rich narrative around the situations that you invite people into. Yeah, I think I think with each show there has to be something that I'm really feeling it's time to talk about. Mm-hmm. So I get kind of a lot of my research is scrolling through Instagram or just like you know what I mean because I, I I'm obsessed by I I think I'm obsessed by gossip and I'm obsessed by humans and you know all the wild things that they do and I think there was this point that I was just I'd woken up again really hungover and I was just like I can't keep on doing this I can't I can't keep on scaring myself shitless with this or just completely obliterating my sense of self when I feel it's a really weird thing because if I'm in the studio and I do something and I feel it's successful then I'm like I want to go to the pub and then I'll have one wine and I'm enjoying that one wine and then that one wine turns to four wines and then it's just like oh fuck it tomorrow's gone and it's just it's like this really it's a really like it's a behavior that I'm trying to break but I don't know it's really weird because someone was asking me whether the work was cathartic or away from me and then suddenly I gave up booze and you know or like suddenly like I did a show which is called Harry on the Inside and it was about me coming to terms with having like <laughs> polycystic ovaries but also like a really big mustache and chin hair and I never really got laser treatment there's my work isn't a form of catharsis it's kind of like a reflective mirror of how I'm feeling in that moment Mm -hmm. and I don't think art does have the power to do that because I don't think it does have the power to heal because it's really painful for me to make it but I think that like unleashing I think with stuff like booze and anxiety and stuff like that one of the things that the reason why it has such a massive hold over us is because we feel such intense shame Mm -hmm. and my idea with I think a lot of these shows is that I'm not going to give these thoughts and these feelings the I'm not going to allow anyone to shame me about my behavior or what I do because that just sucks that someone can have the power to do that because I've held myself back in so many ways because of shame and I think there was always this thing of like holding a mirror up that if you were drinking, if you saw yourself drunk, what would you do? Would you never drink again? And I kind of always imagined that this thing was going to happen and actually like actually holding that mirror up myself and not having someone else post a picture of me drunk or something. It was just the beginning baby steps to not allow shame to control my life. And that's what I'm aiming for first. And I think that when you start doing that, other things start falling into place. Like I'm going to stop being ashamed of who I am as a person, I feel. But probably tomorrow I'll hate myself again. But, you know, yes. it's a, the baby steps before like apologizing for this show, or apologizing for taking up the space or, you know, like at Jupiter, I wanted to make something really fucking beautiful. Yes. And I haven't ever felt I could make something beautiful because you know, like I'm always apologizing or I'm always dragging up the abject. And it's like, actually, to allow myself to do something beautiful was one of the most incredible moments of my life. And I, yeah, I think I've just, I was saying I felt I've learned a lot this year. Quite. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. And is that the first time that um, you've done that, that it's just the very... So... This is, it is a good, so as I said, we're at Tracy Emin Studios and it's a wild place and she had, you have lots of like wild people going around it. And there was this one day that, um, first there's Alyssa um, Cray, who's the director, creative director, and her wife came up to me and said, who thought of doing them white? And I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm never going to go white. I'm colour. And then Bob Geldof was in one day and then he was like, have you thought of doing them white? And I was like, "Gosh, Bob. And then. <laughs> It was like Tracy and Jay and then Jay Jopling. And then, and I'm always really nervous when these people come in. And then I was just after seeing Beyonce really hung over in a line waiting for breakfast. And Tracy was going like, why won't you, why wouldn't you do them white? And I was like, 
because I don't think and I realized because I wouldn't do it because I didn't think they were very good I'm not like I don't think they were good but I didn't believe in my ability to create something formally is that because historically white ceramic has been sort of been held up to be the epitome of good taste and fine taste and also practically it's quite revealing I guess you know it's quite possibly it's been the most revealing show and there was a mirror at every angle so you could see the cracks in everything like there was nowhere to hide and I I was just scared because glaze can hide a multitude of sins like you can like one of the reasons why ceramics are so bloody beautiful is because they they enchant you. They're so luscious and, you know, you're looking at the colour. And if I was taking away, it's like taking away one of your weapons, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And or one like of your... Without makeup. I mean, I never wear makeup because I just can't be bothered. Like, <laughs> I wear my hairy face. No, I just can't be bothered. Like, it just goes down my face anyway. But I think it's more a thing of being able to have complete... Um, belief in the content of the work rather than or, and what I decided to do in that show rather than you know like using other things to do it because like where the bodies are buried I wanted that to be technicolor and have this sort of 90s pop aesthetic and then this was meant to be this part of Jupiter Artland though it's all about Jekyll and Hyde so yeah. one side of it is more modern and more clubby sort of feeling and the other side is talking about sort of an archaic sort of pomposity of believing that, like, I think drink is the great leveler. And mm-hmm. so there's this regal sort of ballroom, but in the back of them all, they're being poisoned by themselves and they're tearing apart. And it just seemed like, and the ballroom that they're in is so beautiful and anything I, I made was going to fight it. Mm-hmm. So also when Tracy is saying to me, like, why aren't you doing this? I I didn't have a good enough answer. And I believe that like, I believe in my complete autonomy and that I, but when someone's asking me those questions and it's Tracy fucking Emin and you're kind of just standing there trying to have a slight argument with her. (laughs) It's like, actually, why not give this a try? I'm not going white every time. Like, no, I love color too much, but it was a nice, it was a nice, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but and, <I'm> posh. <laughs> are, you, are you always exploring new te- not new techniques but new glazes or experimenting and testing things and I did for where the bodies are buried because I had a bit more time but no I'm not and I think that's something that we were talking about I I need a break now I think everyone needs a break from me as well <laughs> <laughs> but I I kind of I I want to go and go back to the drawing board and, and get itchy and go and see loads because going to see other artist shows um is the thing that makes me just I get really excited slash jealous if that makes sense yeah and I go around and I want to go and see and support my friends for you kind of do more this year and kind of try out new things and get things wrong because I think I was talking to you about it, but I was saying like I took on quite a lot recently because there was never the option to stop. Yeah. And I think because rent, everything, and now that I've moved to Margate and the idea was that to pay less and to have a better space and to give myself that time, I've actually got to put a lot of, I hate the word boundaries. Imagine I'm saying, like I hate when people describe something as organic. It's like, no. Like I'm trying to put something in place that allows me to take a bit of a step back, if that makes sense. Yeah, and completely. We- but also you need nourishment, don't you? I know like the first exhibition that I um, worked on at the Sculpture Park was with Andy Goldsworthy and he described his practice as being like a breathing in and a breathing out. And the making of an exhibition or the making of work was a breathing out, but you had to breathe in in between. Yeah, I think you to be able to depict life, you need to have a life too. Yes, that makes sense. like, and I, I'm such a magpie. I think that's a really beautiful way of putting it. Like, I, I do really need to experience life to, and to fuck up life to be able to make the shows about it. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of um, yeah, it's it's felt it's felt like a really great year, but it's also like taken so much out of me. Like the worrying about it, like, like 
the sort of critique that happens from, you know, if you do well in a show, you'll have newspapers writing about it, that this is the same as Jupiter. And it's a very weird thing that I kind of am starting to get my head around because I've been making like no one's watching. Yeah. And I need to protect that. And I need to like not care about, I need to make for myself. And at this moment in time, I just think it needs a little bit of a decompression. I feel very very proud though. You should feel very proud. (laughs) (laughs) It is, yeah, I'm I'm gonna really miss the show when it closes because because it won't exist anymore apart from in our imaginations and our photographs. But you know, it's not, um, it's not a show where the whole thing gets packed up and yeah it it is it will only exist at that and I think one of the um one of the nicest things me and the memory of doing it is that we did get on with the team really well you gave us the best lunch every single day like we so we were all living in a house together so I have two great assistants um Samu and Bryony and then there's Eloise who I work with who's Ladywood and then there's Claire Orme who does the incredible stained glass but we were all just living in a house together which was so fun <laughs> and then we just every night just thought about what we we're gonna have for lunch at that cafe and it was worth it Good. but I don't think we've ever I don't we'd never kind of all come together and stayed together and made on site like that so it was like a really and working with your team as well it felt like a very special orchestra and like one of the my favorite bits is how we all have our heights in the house like from when like when I was little so in the sort of like area everyone's got their height on the marked on one piece of wood because I felt it was really I know that it's like I don't know it's a bit schmaltzy but I really appreciate everyone who I work with because I couldn't do this on my own I I don't believe that I'd ever be able to do this on my own it takes such a massive team of people to keep you up or to you're very honest about that though you're very honest that um it's not just a solo effort. Well, I think one of the things that when you lose your mind, one of the things that you pride the most isn't being on your own, it's being able to live amongst others and to be able to communicate well with others. And you you realise, like, it's not important for any... It, I don't need that, or to, I don't know. I don't believe in that legend. I believe in the fact that I'm proud that I have these sorts of working relationships and I'm proud that we get each other so much. And I mean, you've seen my drawings, they're terrible. So to be able to like create this thing and just through like talking and conversations, like it helps me as well. Yeah. Like, and then you, on my own. and then there's a film, a new film, which is part of the installation that you filmed with Dean Sullivan, who played Jimmy Corkill in Brookside. So you wrote the script. Oh, do you know, again, this is another, this is really hard because all my stories are Tracy stories. But I was talking to him, I was talking to her about it. She's like, I know Dean, who's Jimmy Corkill. I was like, no, you don't. She loves Brookside. So I actually, like, me and Guy thought, we're going to write to, I wrote this monologue, which was trying to give the impression of, like, the telltale heart and a sort of merging of my story with the telltale heart. And that's the Edgar um, Allan Poe story. That's yeah. Yeah, this- the idea, like this heartbeat. And like, I think if you're obsessed, I'm obsessed by true, like not true crime, but like ITV dramas, like, you know, like line of duty and like cracker, um, unforgotten, you know, like all of these, sorts of, they are the most calming thing for me. And I have them on in the studio the whole time. And like, when I was younger, my dad didn't really believe that I shouldn't watch this sort of stuff. So I'd have a really nice time watching TV with him. And that's how we'd sort of bond. Mm-hmm. And the idea was to create this TV program in the space. And we wrote to Jimmy Corkill and he was like, oh, give Tracy my love. It's so lovely to him. And like, it was this really weird thing. He was like, yeah, I'll do it. And I was like, oh, was and I love TV so much. Like my dog's called Telly. <laughs> because there's something I love more than TV. And like, it was the most wild moment of my life being in this, because my parents live in Chester. So we went to the Wirral, me and my dad and my sister and Guy, in this really weird little studio. And like, beautiful, it's really cute, but it was just in the Wirral. Yeah. And filmed him and he was like, you know, he took it so seriously. And he, it was just, it was one of the moments that I just kind of felt 
really proper. You know, and then like my dad was like, he's good, he is. Like, <laughs> it was just, it was a really wonderful moment. And then Guy obviously edited it with all the like found footage from the, from the time so that there's, and that sort of fuzzy TV and graininess as well. So it does feel like you are back there in some sort of respect. And it is that tapping into a, a memory of a particular time of the, yeah, the adverts, but also you've created that the video is this sense of it's the confession. Is it the confessional moment that always happens? Yeah. So that's my favorite bit. Like the bit when it's like, you've held on for so long and then you're just so fucking tired and you just explode. And yeah. I think it's, that's in a recurring thing in my dreams that I'm scared of the idea of losing it completely. And I wanted, I really wanted to be able to create that sort of scene in, in the gallery because I'd never really seen it happen before. If that makes and the sense. way that it's showing on multiple TVs in the installation. Oh, thanks um, for prompting so much good stuff, babe. I'm so glad we've talked so many times at this. Yes, Helen, multiple TVs throughout the installation, just to kind of show that everyone is simultaneously watching. So the other day with the um, women's football, I was so nervous that I just went downstairs and I realised it was something I used to do as a child. Like I'd go in the garden when I was nervous and just listen for other people's uh-huh. reactions if that made sense to know whether we'd scored or you know so I was trying to do that sort of slow tv or slowing down and collective viewing and the way that like you know getting the radio times at Christmas was really important or all of these sorts of things that I think we took for granted at the time yeah so the idea of the communal viewing and everybody yeah. talking about it yeah and like I've worked in a lot of um sort of offices and one of the greatest levelers was all coming in and having seen the same thing on television like and one of it was just like a way that I was able to communicate with people when I couldn't actually communicate myself when I was quite ill so Mm. yeah it was it's really important to me it is kind of like a love letter to tv that show nice isn't it I do love tv (laughs) (laughs) it's quite a northern show as well you know it does feel because your dad's from the north, you know, it felt a bit of a homecoming back towards the north. Yeah, and also as well, like, it's kind of like a, quite a weird love letter to my dad as well, like in that sort of thing of with all the building works, because he's a building services engineer, and, like, it's a very confusing... It's all the things that are confusing about how you feel about people within your family and... Yeah, it's a it's a hard one for me to unpick because there's a lot of stuff there that I didn't realise was there because this never happens to me usually. I'm usually like, there were bits that were in the show that I didn't realise that were there and I I feel quite vulnerable that they are actually there but they I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> um, you know, when I said, why are there a stack of what car magazines from November, yeah. you know, whenever... And that's because they would be in, it was, it was almost like um, an insight into your life at that yes. point in time, like a snapshot of little, little details. I think it's, it's so, it's so weirdly personal and it's really hard because I, I think that like, right. So I'm going to try and talk about this without fully talking about this, but because, you know, I'm growing up. Um yeah. But I've sort of been in a household where my father is very much the dominant figure. Mm-hmm. It's, it's been a tumultuous sort of household. It's 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 been painful and it's been hard. And I think I keep on coming back to the house for that reason. I think the house has so many secrets and it withhold, it contains so much power and we hide within them and I think I I'm seeing that I keep on coming back to the house more and more and I think this was the most personal of houses that I've made and I feel like with all the hints of that it's just so hard because yeah I'm trying to protect oh that's bleach falling on the floor perfect I'm trying to protect myself slightly with it because I know that it's come from 
lots of complicated relationships and family dramas, but it's also, yeah. But then also this installation, your family were in part of the making of it as well. So I love the end of the the video that you made. You thank everybody. I mean, the, the generosity, people just, when they see their name, so people from our team or from our, our colleagues who come in and they see the name, they, they're, they're like, oh, my God, you know. I think, that's, I think that's wild because in film you'd credit like that. Do you know uh, what I mean? Like, like you can't make something with that much ambition on your own. Like I'd have to have 800 arms <laughs> and brains. And I think it's but really your lovely. Made, what your, what your mum made the bean bags with the scream. Yeah. And the scream film graphics. Yeah. Your dad's I, driver. Yeah, he was the driver. And then my sister went out to get all the snacks when we were filming Jimmy. Yes. It's not his name, it's Dean Sullivan. (laughs) Yeah, I think, I yeah, it's quite an odd thing to do to get everyone involved. But I think that they just quite, they all believe in it now and they know how much I do need to be supportive and supported. And it does mean a lot to me, but also... I I do really believe in saying thank you. Like I, like I don't think I could have got got here. Like I haven't got me here. Like there's a lot that's come from me, but it's a lot of support from really generous people. And to think that you do something on your own entirely is just wild to me. It's it's disingenuous. I I believe that like there's no way I could have got here without support of all the people that I thank in that video and with each exhibition it's never just me and I'm really proud that we all do it together and I hope the people around me who I work with are as well I'm yeah. waffling <laughs> the, the, the ambition that you bring to each project I mean each time I've seen your exhibitions your installations with part of um Strange Clay and the um Carl Friedman shows it feels like how are you going to then go? I mean, is that a pressure you put on yourself? You feel you have to go the next level each time? I do panic that the ideas will run out, but I'm really good because I got, I went to see, not I'm really good, but like I went to see something that angered me so much, which okay. was the um, Ugly Duchess. Right. Okay. At the National Gallery. And how it was like, this woman's 35 and we're celebrating Leonardo da Vinci drawing this woman like this. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah. (laughs) And I, you know, it's like, you know, you go, you know when I was saying that you have to go and see things to be able to, and then I feel the fire kicking up in my belly again. And then my best friend is um, a singer. Yeah. And she said to me, she sent me a message. She's like, Linz, what do we think about age? And I was just like, we've just pinged these images back and forth. <laughs> they were in the same. We love like having these sorts of conversations. And I know I want to start making again. And I don't feel like what we do is too ambitious. I think it's just right. Like I leave them just feeling like, yeah, that's done. And I don't, I feel like they're also calling cards to the people who might want to work with you next. Yeah. Who want to take that on. And I don't know. I just don't want, I just, I couldn't do it any less. I just really couldn't. Like, it's what makes me happy. It, The works and the sculptures just aren't enough. They don't say enough. It has to be a multi-sensory. <laughs> I'm going to attack you on all levels. <laughs> but I think that, I mean, like a lot of the artists that I love don't do that. But I think for me, the experience that I want to create, like I do get worried actually that I won't be able to, top it but that would always be thinking that the thing you made was the last greatest thing and I don't you know does that make sense Uh, but also I suppose each each thing you're making you you're developing the experience of making as well and pushing the making in different directions not just the concept of what you want to realize but how you're going to realize it and I know that you said that you'd um wanted to incorporate stained glass um but that that particular process didn't suit you or the way you make. And then that's where working with Claire Orme Mm. and the elements that she brought in. Do you think there are other techniques that you're going to want to, it feels like you're you're stretching yourself each time and challenging yourself. I think, I think that to stop being hungry would be to stop wanting to make art. 
yeah if that makes sense like so every time I make a show it's like an itch I have to scratch or I'm hungry and I want to learn more or you know like so I kind of feel like I would be losing the ability to make if I didn't attack it each time because I just went to this most amazing church in Tinos and um I can't remember what it's called but basically what happens is um you prayed it's like the it's like the Mary's church I don't want to get this wrong but it's on the top of a hill and you pray to this um to Mary and then you climb up the top of the hill to the top of the hill um, on your hands and knees so there are these people crawling up the hill going to this church and then inside the church there's all of these effigies and offerings that are all made of metal and it's just all hanging from the ceiling and it's beautiful and I was just looking at that and I was just like that last show wasn't enough was it you know like I'm yeah. obsessed by churches or you know yeah. if if religion was taken out of churches they would be like the most in- oh, I'm not going to get in there that's a <laughs> <laughs> it, like it's one of the most inspiring places to me because it's so multi-layered and I I want that density in my work so yeah I've lost the tra- train of thought sorry no no that was that made, all made total sense but there is also humor as well so although you are exploring painful difficult subject matter there is always there's always a strand of humour that kind of offsets. Yeah, I, it's really hard to say you're funny though, isn't it? <laughs> I know. It's really hard to be like, yeah. Uh, I think, I think it's, I think that people, I think that life isn't one note. I think I've spoken um, about this quite a bit, but like none of my time, like even if I'm in one of the worst states that I'm in, it's never not there's never not an ounce of humor that you know permeates it so like one time I was really crying and I was really upset about something and then telly's on my face just licking my eyeballs or you know there's moments where someone says something and it cuts through everything and I believe that some of the most tender moments in our life are and the most important times in our life are when that strikes that balance between the two because that idea of just being singularly shouted at or, you know, not having any sort of humour within it at all, I don't... Seriously, you need lightness to be able to understand the gravitas of something else. Yeah. It's like, have you read, is it, um, I want to say Umberto Eco's book, on light, and he, is it him? Because I get him confused with someone else. But there's an essay on lightness, and it's talking okay. about how important the role of Mercutio is in to in um, Romeo and Juliet to be able to understand the gravity of this or to be able to enjoy the love story that much you need that role and the you know the nurse's role as well so it's the contrast that highlights yeah and that's the same as like planning like so every time I do an installation I think about it like a theatrical play and like the ceramics of the protagonist and then there's all the different layers to be able to build up that sense of disbelief and that you're walking through this sort of stage set. So, because a lot of Eloise's background is in sort of stage um, design. And I want it to, I want the ceramics to sing within the pieces, but then also that to be able to contextualize them and to actually give yourself over to the idea, the dressage is equally as important. Yeah. And why couldn't that dressage be a work of art as well? And the, yeah, because your installation at YSP was complete once the the flowers were put in. You know? Yeah. That was the moment, wasn't it? It was like the, the finish, the completion. Well, I think when, so it's very, Margate is a very weird um, sort of place to live because Claire Orme, who's doing the stained glass, she was saying, oh, my partner, Ned, who owns the Crab Museum, yeah, um, was talking about how that would decompose. And I was like, Ned, I'm so sorry. Is there any chance you could do us a PowerPoint on decomposition? Because I'd really like to learn more about it. And he, he told us all the sort of different bugs that would be in it on how something would decompose in water, how something would decompose in a bin bag, you know, like under the floorboards, so it would be drier. And it was such an important magical layer that went towards, because also like I used to be a history student and got an A star at GCSE. Hey. <laughs> my proudest moment um 
but like I really loved that sort of sense of learning and research and it was really amazing when he was sort of teaching us about that oh no I've just lost what my trail of thought did you say no no but that is really interesting though the the decomposition and actually that it's really beautiful yes okay and then it creates the most fertile soil for plants yeah. and and for flowers and stuff so I was imagining this dream which was like my nightmare but actually being this really fertile technicolor rich place for other sort of ideas and other sort of thoughts so yeah it was like it, through learning about you know a little bit of biology it <laughs> It yeah. kind of was helpful. <laughs> it made me less scared scared about rotting, and it made me <laughs> no. But it, I've got this. I know what you mean, though. That you actually know what's going to happen after. That it's not the end. There's, yeah, there's... but it, that actually, that if you are buried straight into the soil, that you will become food, and then you will create this patch of soil that is actually so fertile. It's ridiculous. And like from being so scared of like that sort of you know we're all quite scared of death aren't we like from, from that's that also, like if you know that as well that that's a very clear indication of where the bodies are buried isn't it if there's suddenly this sort of beautiful yeah. flourishing yeah and I think I think that's kind of like one of the elements of like how do you get rid of a nightmare and I haven't been having the nightmare as much and, yeah which is really peculiar but since learning more about the nightmare I feel like I've managed to unpick it slightly and I've I've kind of laid it to rest. That makes that sense. sense. We've got a few questions and actually the first one does connect to that. Um, given your work is so personal, this is Lyra, uh, given your work is so personal, where do you draw the line? How far you go with it? How do you know where, when to stop? And how do you manage holding the voltage this kind of work brings? Oh, I don't. You don't draw a line? I think I do draw the line to some extent, but I think one of the problems when you have OCD um, is that you constantly keep on talking about these things. So in that respect, it is a saturation. It is sort of saturating my sort of need for catharsis, being able to talk about it and ruminate on it over and over again. Um, I think there is there is a limit, and I think I just learned it while we were when we yeah. were talking about this like I think I'm learning what I want to put out there more I used to talk really candidly about everything that was in was in was within work um and I've laid that off a bit but I think that you can make the work as personal as you'd like but you can kind of leave it to speak for itself a bit more rather than having to kind of cheer it on everywhere if that makes sense and do people contact you to 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 say thank you that you know that perhaps things that they thought only they were thinking or going through they yeah. saw in the world. it's one of the things that makes it the most worthwhile like it it's really lovely when someone does message you and say well messages me and sort of says I went to go and see this and you know when they say that they've taken their family or they said that it, they say that it resonates with them and it's like one of those feelings of feeling far less alone mm-hmm and I, I think when I started making this type of work, there wasn't as much dialogue around mental health and conversations. And I'm watching that evolve more and more. So the more the shows are sort of being seen, the more sort of conversations I'm having about that, which is really wonderful. It's, I said that so deadpan, it's really wonderful. But it's it's lovely to see that people feel that they can reach out. Yeah rather than just like wallow in shame because that's kind of what I do when I'm not in the studio <laughs> also you know there have been a lot of people who've been to see it and I'm sure there are yes, all a lot there that are all <laughs> that um that we've experienced throughout our lives that we go back to so you know it's it's sowing a seed in people's minds as well isn't it that it will continue to exist in their memories and I'm sure that young people, a lot of the people who've been through the schools program, it's going to start something in them. Like you've said before, that there were particular teachers you had, for example, that changed the course of your life. And we know that art has the power to do that. Yeah, I think I think for those people who find it very hard to communicate, like we're we currently we have on a summer school at Quench, it's just come to an end. But Gemma Furrow, who's um we we run this um, 
we run this space called Quench Gallery, me and my partner. And, and that nicely leads on to the second question. <laughs> you also opened your own gallery, which is great. It's <laughs> giving you a different perspective on artists. And yeah. Productions. Um, it, yeah. So the idea was in the pandemic. Um, I'm quite a doer. And when I feel frustrated and when I feel like anxious about the world, I try and put something into motion and me and my partner decided to open this gallery in Margate because we were nervous about moving here, but we also wanted to be a part of the community. And um, we, through Arts Council funding and through my additions, we managed to give um, artists a bursary to put on older or newer work. But also, we've also this year um, run a summer school and for young people because we're not, I mean, for, through like the really scary reports that are coming out about the amount of kids who are encouraged to do art or make art it's it terrifies me because it was for me it was my biggest solace like I was 13 and I overdosed and I couldn't find a path in school and I felt very lost and then obviously I was shown Tracy Emin's work by my art teacher at the time and he was like you need to take something a bit more seriously and you can't keep living you know yeah it since that moment and seeing her work which is so weird this is why it all becomes so hard like my life changed and I had a I had this sort of sense of purpose and I found it within an arts department so I don't believe that we should pick up the slack of social care with the, with how this government is going but I'm not going to let it yeah die either if that makes sense like I'm and I feel like when you are selling more as an artist, which has started to happen to me, and I'm really fortunate, I don't want to pull up the ladder, and I I do want to actually give back. I think it's it's so important to. I don't and yeah, so, but I but Gemma and um, Guy run have run French a lot more for this month because well this year sorry because it's been a lot to take on if that makes sense well no I mean it's a lot there's a lot of programs there's a lot of exhibitions and there was a summer school so you could from Margaret yeah. participate in the summer school which looked amazing as well yeah I, I think that Gemma's just absolutely amazing and something that we've been trying to push further a lot more with Quench is our audience outreach um and the work that she does with like young people it's it's turned quench into something that's not just about showing art it's it feels like it's got a duality to it now that it feels a bit more important and a bit it's grounding itself a lot more in the community which i think is one of the most important things in a small pl- town like margate because i mean as a place the more you put into it the better your life and the more fruitful your life is and but it seems like you're bridging between a few different communities because there's there's an art community in Margate there's a, a, a kind of resident you know pe- people who've lived whose families have lived in Margate mm-hmm. at the time and it seems like you're bringing those people together in a really lovely way yeah hopefully but I think there's only I mean we're still humans and artists and there's only so much that art can do like is it going to make the council pick up like do the bins better no but I mean actually like it, it's it's trying to do something rather than just sitting back and yeah not and, moment, but you know what I mean I think we, have to have faith, <laughs> I think we have to have faith that if we we try people that it does you know like the people who have commented to you about the difference your work has made to them or the experience has made to them yeah and, I think I think that just the moment that I stopped trying that would just be such a sad I still believe in like what I'm doing and I still believe that art has a lot of power um it's just it can really crush you and like it can sometimes feel like I'm getting to a point where it's feeling like that less but the years leading up to these last three years when it's gone well was so crushing and demoralizing and the amount of applications I'd write to just have nothing come back or you know it, it can it can really break you and you can wonder why you're doing it. And I still get that now half the time because, you know, you put something out there and people, a million people can say it's shit or have an opinion or it as, you know, you're like, why am I doing this? But 
there must just be something very deep within and also within you because you're always doing curating these shows after shows after shows there's something very deep within us that truly must believe in it and I but also I think it's what else would we do <laughs> do you know what I mean there's a bit um, of yeah I mean <laughs> I'm trying to think what I'd have my skill set I would I would have quite liked to have been a lawyer but I cry too much <laughs> can you imagine doing someone's defense and then just crying so you know I will go work on the crying <laughs> this is the emotional space that I can you know I can flourish in <laughs> if that makes sense god I talk shit sorry <laughs> all mate really good sense but I am conscious of your time and that is probably people's dinner time so I'm going to wrap up with uh, the last two questions which are linked um, at Jupiter's PT, at Jupiter, um, was the idea for the show shaped by the room and the dovecote out of the space generate the idea? It was brilliant, by the way. They worked so well together. And then linked to that, um, when the installations are removed, this is for Philip, what happens to all the unique pieces? Oh, okay. So the one about the rooms, the, what the linking of the rooms, the dovecote and the... Yeah, so at Jupiter was the show generated by the room. Yes. Yeah. Like, so you so, saw the room and then... I think both shows were, like, yeah. at YSP it was the room as well because YSP was like, how the hell, this lovely light and airy room, how do we make it into a dungeon? And then... <laughs> <laughs> and then the idea at Jupiter was kind of... I didn't want to attack the space. Mm-hmm. And I, I think... I kind of wanted to work in harmony with it. And I think that because it was such a delicate subject matter and it was very delicate for me, I wanted it to speak softly. And I hoped that's what happened. Like in certain places, it was quite loud and vicious, but mostly I felt like that show had to have a lot of tact in order for me to make it without Mm -hmm. destroying myself and revealing everything of myself. So I hope there are like quieter moments and moments where you can relax and then moments when you're kind of a bit shocked again. So it was needing, it was needing quite a bit of, you know, I don't know, orchestration in that sort of way that it had peaks and troughs and moments where you could just breathe for a bit. And then other parts where you were kind of full frontal, full frontal, that's not the right word. But just, kind of, but you're just yeah. yeah. So I think it needed those sorts of notes and, um, yeah, I hope both shows do have those. But yeah, God, I've lost words now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have talked for quite, well, you have shared a huge amount and I yes. really, <laughs> given a lot and I'm really, um, I'm really grateful to everyone for joining as well. And for- I'm, I'm really grateful to you as well and for how much like also, People don't know stuff like this, but the night after the PV did uh, give me the most brilliant bacon sandwich I've ever had while our dogs humped each other. <laughs> like, your generosity knows no bounds. It wasn't glamorous, but it was... <laughs> like, brunch, no, I think brunch is... Hospitality. Was she was about three. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do we do really try to make sure everyone feels very well looked after and hosted. That's, I think that's something that you should like we didn't leave there tired which I think was such a lovely way to feel and just left like very happy and looked after and it's the same at Jupiter and I, I just yeah big thank you I, well thank you everybody thank you so much Lindsay um Thank you for everything and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Take care. Bye. I was about to say good night. <laughs>